outstanding question. All right, now we're going to talk about cross-examination. You see on the screen a picture from an old TV show. This attorney's name is Perry Mason. And the show had a formula. Perry Mason's client always looked like he was going to go to prison. And then Perry Mason, by brilliant cross-examination, would make the witness cry. And then the witness would say, I did it. I committed the murder. That's not how things work in real life. <laughs> but you can win a case in cross-examination. You can lose a case in cross-examination. I love cross-examination. I've always loved it as a trial lawyer. And I love it uh, presiding over a really good cross-examination as a presiding judge. So, here are my 10 tips for effective cross-examination. Tip number one, actually have a strategy. What do I mean? Well, first of all, you've got to understand how your cross-examination of the witness is going to fit into the entire trial. You need to know what your team's theme is. Your cross-examination needs to further the theme. And you also need to know what you're going to get out of this cross-examination for the closing argument. Remember we talked earlier today about not having a canned closing argument that cannot be flexible to adapt to what you get and what you don't get during the trial. If you have an effective cross-examination, you should be automatically generating material for the closing argument. So that's part of your strategy, to get what you need for closing argument. And how do you do that? First, you learn the entire witness statement. You know every comma. You know every dotted I and cross T in the witness's statement. So if that witness strays off the statement even a little bit, you know what's there and what, what's not there. Figure out in advance what you think the other side is going to get out of that witness on direct exam. And then once you have all that in mind, say to yourself, what are my objectives? What do I want to accomplish in this cross-examination? Maybe it's to show that the witness is not credible because he or she is dishonest. Maybe you want to get out just a few positive facts, but list your, your objectives, write them out, and have them in mind. Tip number two, turn your strategy into clusters. Clusters, what do you mean by that, Justice Lillehout? What I mean is you're going to take those objectives and you're going to organize them into clusters or modules or packages. You can choose the word you want for cross-examination. And each one is going to be self-contained. You can use them in one order, you can switch the order, you can work in facts that come out during direct examination, but each objective is going to be turned into a cluster. So how do you prepare a cluster? Well, typically it will consist of a series of questions where you're laying out what the facts are and then it's going to come to an ultimate question where you're going to get something out of the cross-examination. That's what I mean by a, a cluster. And you can write out those questions. You can practice them. You can look into a mirror and pretend you're cross-examining yourself. You'll usually fail. But it's all going to lead up to some question where you get something out of the examination. Then, as the direct examination is going on, you can either in your head or on a piece of paper figure out what the order is of the clusters. Maybe you're not going to use one of your clusters because the direct examination didn't get into that subject. But you, you, can, you can figure out what the order is and you're most effective that way. Then once you figure out what your clusters are, here goes cross-examination. Tip number three, lead the witness by the nose. What do I mean by that? You're not going to give this witness any leeway because you know what you're going to do? You're going to use very short questions. And you're going to use plain words. There's not going to be any word that the witness doesn't understand. It's boom, 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 boom. And as much as possible, in order to make sure the witness cannot say he or she doesn't understand, you're going to use the exact words, the witness's own words from the statement. Short question, plain words, use the witness's words from the statement. So the witness can't say, I don't understand what you mean by umpty ump. Well, isn't that the word you used in your statement, umpty ump? Oh, yeah, I guess it was. And then another thing that I mentioned during my comments this morning about the use of notes, try to refer to the witness's answer during direct examination. 
During direct examination, you testified, and I want to make sure I got this right, X, Y, Z. And then go off that question into your own question. So you can tie your, your cross-examination to what happened during direct examination. Why is that good? Because the witness then is boxed in to what he or she said on direct examination. But in addition, you're going to get points for using the direct examination. You're not just going to have some canned cross-examination. You actually will have listened to the direct examination and you're using it. Use only leading questions. Use only leading questions. You need the witness to answer yes or no as much as possible, or one-word answers. You want to elicit yes, no, one-word answer, or I don't know. And we're going to talk in a little bit what happens when the witness filibusters. Now, just because you're using short questions, you're using plain words, you're getting yes or no answers, that doesn't mean your cross-examination has to be boring. You can ask short questions with plain words, getting short answers in a variety of different ways. And when you finish your cluster, you're going to have received, gotten something interesting from the witness, and then you'll move on to your next cluster. So lead the witness around by the nose. Don't let that witness go anywhere. So one, uh, one, this is not a tip. This is really an explanation. What do I mean by a leading question? There are many, many times when I'm presiding and a lawyer will get up, objection, your honor, leading. But it's not a leading question. What is a leading question? A leading question suggests a desired answer or puts words in the mouth of the witness. So let's compare these two questions. What color was the light? The light was red, wasn't it? OK, which one's the leading question? The second one. The first, an the first question is susceptible to a one-word answer. What color was the light? Red. What color was the light? Green. What color was the light? Yellow. But the, answer, the question did not suggest the desired answer. How about this one? When you looked at the light, it was turning, wasn't it? Anybody want to object to that as leading? Y yes. Yes, objection, leading. The light was turning, wasn't it? And in fact, that's one of the, the code words that you can listen for. If, it says, if the question says, wasn't it, didn't it, correct, isn't it true, those are all indicators of leading questions. But just because a question is short, using short words, and having a short answer doesn't mean that it's leading. But you're on, you're on cross-examination. You can use leading questions all day long, and I recommend that you do so to keep the witness under control. Tip number four, open your cross-examination with power, pow. Figure out what your best sure winner is and start the cross-examination with that. I was reminded of this during the uh, final round of the national tournament in 2010. My daughter was on the team in the final round. And one of her teammates um, had a chance to examine the lead witness for the other side. And here's what he did. Cross-examination, Mr. Stillman. Thank you, Your Honor. You would do or say anything to help so-and-so. That was in the witness's statement, that he would do or say anything to help another witness. No preliminaries. Thank you. I'm going to be answering you, asking you a number of questions today. If you don't understand a question, please tell me. He just got right up and did it. Pow. And the answer to the question had to be yes. He knew the answer had to be yes. And right out of the box, that witness was in big trouble because the cross-examiner opened with power. And then, when you get the right answer, just pause for a moment. Let it sink in. You've scored your first big victory, but you don't pause so long that the witness gets comfortable or starts to think, hmm, I wonder how I can change that answer. You go pow, and then a pause. Tip number five, listen and actually follow up. Now, cross-examination is a process of questions and answers, but you'd be surprised how often attorneys don't actually listen to the answer. You should know exactly what the answer is going to be, because if you don't know the answer, then you don't want to ask the question. You never ask a question where you don't know the answer, 
Or you may not know the answer, but either way the witness answers the question is going to be helpful for you. But sometimes you'll ask the question and the witness will answer in an unexpected way and it's, you're so busy going on to your next question, a gift has just been given to you and you don't take advantage of it. So actually listen to the answer and also make sure that the witness has answered the question. The witness's answer may be fumbling, it may be elliptical. The witness may mumble. Make sure the witness actually answers the question. And then, if you've prepared your clusters properly, you're going to be able to use that answer for the next question. Question. The light turned green, didn't it? Yes. So when the light turned green, you did this, didn't you? Yes. See how I tied the second question to the first question? And each cluster, you can use the previous answer and move on to the next question. So listen and follow up. Tip number six, use the witness's statement and the exhibits to impeach. Now let me just stop right there. Impeachment is difficult. It's difficult because you're going to have to in involve something else in your cross-examination. It's not just asking a question. You're going to have to refer to the witness statement or refer to an exhibit. And that can take time. And if you don't do it the right way, and you start consuming too much time, the other lawyers on your team are going to be going, God, he's using all my time. It's driving me crazy. So you need to do all this very efficiently and know exactly what you're going to do and make it part of your cluster. Or if you hear the witness deviating from the statement on direct examination, make sure you know precisely what line in the, the statement you're going to refer to. And then you refer both the witness and the judges to the exact phrase and line in the statement or the exact place in the exhibit. And every step needs to be done efficiently. So at the very least, you keep the judge interested, you get your impeachment done, you get it done within a proper period of time, and your teammates are happy because they still have a little time for their own cross-examination. Now, before we get to the next tip, here's the big problem. Darn witness just won't stop. Yes, blah, 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 but blah, 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 blah. And as I pointed out in my direct examination, blah, 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 blah. And you're standing there, and the clock is ticking. Tick, 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 tick. And your teammates are, again, going, I'm going to have one minute left for my cross-examination. How could he do that to me? Why doesn't he get the witness to stop? This is the big, big problem in cross-examination and mock trial. Am I right about that? Blah, 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 blah. The witness is, you, you get a concession from the witness, and then the, she says, but blah, 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 undermining the very concession that you got. So what's the solution? Tip number seven, prevent and stop witness filibustering. You can prevent it, you can stop it, you can repel it. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you don't give the witness a chance to filibuster. You ask short, clear questions that absolutely require the answer. That's why you're doing leading questions, so that you know what the answer is. But then you say, well, that's just fine, but the witness may answer yes or no, and then just go off. So what do you do? I've got some suggestions, and it's called a system of progressive discipline. You're going to progressively discipline the witness. How do you do that? First of all, let me tell you a way of doing it that I don't particularly like. And it's kind of grown up in Minnesota mock trial over the years. The witness answers the question, but then goes on and on. Then what the lawyer typically says, now I'd like to redirect you to my question and ask you again. Okay. And it's usually done in kind of a snarky way. Judges don't like snarky. They don't like sarcastic. They want you to be courteous and professional. And usually if you just do it on the first time, the judge is saying, what's the big deal? Why, why did this lawyer get so nasty? Minnesota is courteous. Minnesota is professional. Minnesota judges demand that. So I would do a system of progressive discipline. The first time the witness does that, I would say, so the answer to my question is yes. <laughs> and then they'll look kind of sheepish and answer yes. But let's say they don't look sheepish the second time. I'd appreciate it if you'd conform your answer to my question. So the answer to my question is yes. So again, you've told the witness you would appreciate it if they would do something. That's Minnesota nice, isn't it? 
I would appreciate it if you'd conform your answer to my question. Let me ask you the question again. Or, so the answer to my question is yes. So the first time you just say, so the answer to my question is yes. The second time you tell them how much you appreciate them. <laughs> the third time, okay, now you're going to get a little tougher. Mr. Jones, I promise you'll have plenty of time on redirect to explain your answer. So the answer to my question is yes. So remind, remind them and remind the judge that there is a redirect examination, and that's when they can go blah, 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 explain, explain, explain. So you've tightened it up a little bit, and because it's the third time, the judge is going to give you some leeway. The judge is going to start getting a little bit annoyed. And then the fourth time, Mr. Witness, once again, my question called for a yes or no answer. So the answer to my question is yes. So the fourth time, you've reminded the judge and reminded the witness this has been going on and on. And then the fifth time, and you may hit it on the, the fourth time, you say, Your Honor, I respectfully request that the witness be directed to answer the question yes or no. And by this time, the judge is, thank God, yes, witness, answer the question yes or no. <laughs> the judge is going to be happy about that. The judge is going to want to rule for you. But if you start way back at number one, now I'd like to redirect you to my question the judge is going to say, I don't necessarily like that attorney very much. But if you do a system of progressive discipline to keep the witness from filibustering, the judge is going to be very relieved and want to rule in your favor. So you go to the judge only as a last resort. Now, here's the place where you're going to get some extra points. Here's the place where you're going to get some extra points. When you've got a particularly evasive witness, when you or your fellow team member can comment on it in closing, that's where you get dessert and you get a cherry on top of the dessert. Because once again, the judge is going to note that you took something that happened during the trial and you used it in your closing. Okay, now questions? A couple of observations. One, it seems that uh, when you get into this, that the way uh, some of the attorneys and or witnesses want to handle it is to just get into an escalating voice. <laughs> Who can speak the loudest? You know, they want to stop them and they don't stop, and, and uh, that's bad for everybody. Uh, I know that I have uh, personally talked to more than one coach who thought that their job in training the students on cross examination is to teach them to be evasive and obstructionist. They would teach the witnesses to be evasive and obstructionist. Right, that's right. And I just think that that is so wrong that it doesn't fly with juries, judges, anyone. Uh, and then, <coughs> The other thing that you didn't touch on is I think that, you know, there is that possibility of the objection uh, as the answer being non-responsive and ask the part after the yes or no to be stricken. Uh, again, maybe not the first time it happens, but... Uh, yeah, um, to respond to your series of, of comments, uh, first of all, I'm not a big fan of asking that the rest of the answer be stricken. I think if you do this system of progressive discipline, you're going to get the witness back by the nose, and you're not going to have to do that. If the judge has instructed the witness to answer yes or no, and then the witness doesn't, then, of course, you can move that the everything after the word yes or no be stricken. I suppose that could be step number six in the system of progressive discipline. Now, there are a bunch of you in this room who are going to be witnesses. And I understand precisely the benefits of not answering questions yes or no, and explaining things that you've already explained on direct and reminding the judge about what you've already explained. You've got to do that carefully. And with an amateur attorney who's not leading you around by the nose, you'll probably have some liberty to do it. But when you get a really crackerjack cross-examiner, after a while, you're going to look like the bad guy. Because all of this examination and the escalating system of discipline is going to be done very nicely and professionally and courteously. And then you're going to start looking like the obstructionist. So tip for witnesses in the room, you've got to, got to balance your tactics here, depending on the kind of attorney that you have. Question. I, I would just observe that even if my attorney can't exercise the kind of control you want, I as a judge don't reward a witness who's clearly being evasive. The comment is, judges don't reward evasive witnesses. Well, that's true, but some witnesses are really, really good at evasion. <laughs> and you can't even sort of notice that they're evading until after you're done, and you realize that guy didn't get anything done in cross-examination. 
So um, I, I, I think the, following the, the, the battle between a really good cross-examiner and a really good witness is fascinating. And let's understand, this is the centerpiece of the trial. Everybody has an opening statement, everybody has a closing statement, everybody does direct, most of which is memorized and pre-programmed. This is the moment during trial, the cross-examination, when the trial is really going to be won or lost, and the momentum can shift from one side to the other. So that's how to deal with filibustering witnesses. And I want to say the same thing about that I said about unfair extrapolation this morning. Rather than getting frustrated about it, view it as an opportunity. Because if you can show the witness as being evasive and obstructionist, and you deal with it effectively, then you're going to get the big points. Then you've got the possibility of the 10 or the 9 in your cross-examination. Yes? I've seen it in mock trial several times where the lawyer will just say, thank you, and expect the witness to stop talking. It's another good way, another good way of doing it. But sometimes the witness keeps going. Yeah, sometimes if the witness, you can just say, thank you. But do it in a non-sarcastic way. Do it in the politest way possible. Then if the witness keeps going, then the witness looks impolite. There are a variety of different ways. Your system of progressive discipline may be a little different than mine, but that's the way I'd approach it. Don't go to the judge in the first instance. Yes? How would you go about commenting on it in closing? I, in, in closing, let's say you're talking about Witness Jones. Now I'd like to turn to Witness Jones' testimony. Wasn't it remarkable how evasive she was on cross-examination? How every time she needed to admit something, she tr tried to obstruct the court from learning the information and learning the truth. You can conclude that Witness Jones was not credible. And if Witness Jones is not credible, then the defense's entire case crumbles. Now, you see how I did that? I was commenting on Witness Jones' testimony. If you've just got a canned closing, you're going to be talking about Witness Jones, but you're not going to be tying it to anything that's happened in the trial before. That's where you get the big points. So what is cross-examination? Tip number eight, it's like music. When you listen to music, it depends what mood you're in, but wouldn't you prefer music that has some ups and downs and some pauses instead of just boom, 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 boom. Boom, boom, boom may be just fine for one minute or two minutes, but it's usually not very good for 15 or 20 minutes. So I want you to play your cross-examination like music. You may ask some questions where the words come out pretty fast. You may slow down to provide emphasis to your question. So the judge will remember it. You may, when you're asking uh, questions that are where there's not going to be any disagreement, do so in kind of a low voice. And then when it comes time for the big moment, then you may raise your voice, not in a shrill way, but in a profound way. Your gestures. If you're going like this all the time, then you're not getting anywhere. But when you are making your key point, you might say, I, I would never do a pointing finger at the witness, by the way. We in Minnesota, we don't like pointing fingers. That may be okay in New York, <laughs> but it's not okay in Minnesota. Instead, more an open palm. Or if, you're gonna, if you have to do some pointing, do it with two fingers and never with something like this, <laughs> okay? But vary your gestures because it's like music. And you want to vary your physical position as well. Now, in cross-examination, can anybody tell me where you want to locate yourself vis-a-vis -vis the witness? Okay, let's say the judge is sitting here, the witness is sitting here. Do I want to be on this side or do I want to be on that side? I want to be over here because I want the witness looking at me and not looking at the judge. Now, what's the other danger though when I position myself over here? I might be in right in front of the opposing team. And there's nothing that can ruin a cross-examination like opposing counsel. Uh, Your Honor, objection could counsel relocate himself so he's not blocking the view of our witness? Then suddenly all the momentum of your cross-examination is done. So when you move, you want to position yourself properly. 
That does not mean, by the way, that you need to stay planted in the same spot. Remember I talked about clusters? You finish one idea on cross-examination and you're moving to another? That's a good time to move. You finish the, the, la the answer to your last question. Now, see how I did that? Just a little, little movement. It indicates to the judge I'm moving from one topic to another. And it keeps you interesting, rather than just being planted in one spot using the same gesture. Tip number nine. End your cross-examination with power. Power. This is the famous photo of Muhammad Ali. He's just ended his cross-examination with power. <laughs> I think it was a cross of some sort. So um, you will have started your cross-examination with a big winner. If you can do so, end your cross-examination with a big winner also. And then you finish with a confident, thank you, Mr. Jones. I have no further questions. Now, you don't say it in a snarky way. You don't say it in a super arrogant, overconfident way. But it's a confident way. You know you've done your job, and you've done your job well. So then <laughs> you say, you've, been, you've just cut up that witness. And at the end, they can just barely walk off the stand. They may not be crying. They may not be confessing to the murder. But you will have had an effective cross-examination where you very politely and courteously just cut up the witness. And then finally, I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but this deserves its own tip. Don't let it go to waste. Don't let it go to waste. When you got all that stuff in cross-examination, let's hear about it again. It's closing argument. And so again, instead of a canned closing argument that you're reading off the back of your eyeballs, you're telling the judge what's happened during the trial. You can say, if you're referring to your own cross-examination, and your honor, do you remember when I asked Witness Jones whether the light was red or green? And do you remember how she didn't want to answer that question? I submit that a witness that does not want to answer that question is not credible. And if Witness Jones is not credible, then Witness Jones' case, then, then the defense's case has disintegrated. Now, that took all of about 10 seconds for me to say that. But the judge is going to be great connection from cross-examination to closing argument. So don't let it go to waste. Use all of your winners from cross in your closing. Thank you. And are there any questions or any leading questions for me? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you talked about positioning yourself with respect to the witness. Uh, you need an occasion to get over there, right? Like an exhibit yeah. or something that gives you permission to be over there in the first place so that you can be occupying that space close to the witness. Well, one of the typical motions that someone will make at the beginning of the trial is to ask the court for permission to move freely around the well of the courtroom. Now, some judges may not grant that. Some of them are so used to the idea that counsel have to remain exactly at the table or behind a podium that they'll say no, in which case then you have no opportunity for positioning. But if the answer is yes, that doesn't mean you're right up in the witness's face. You're not, you're not like this. That's intimidating the witness. You may be back here a ways, so the witness is looking at you and not turning to the judge. Or the witness may figure out precisely what you're doing, but then has to look at you to listen to the question, then has to turn. And you get a witness going like this, everybody's going to get dizzy in the courtroom. So ask for permission to move around the well, about the well of the courtroom, but you don't want to be approaching the witness and be right on top of the witness. Remember, when you approach a witness to show an exhibit as you're impeaching with a statement or with an exhibit, you have to ask the judge for permission to approach the witness. Other questions? Yes? Do you remind cross-examiners to be sure they've got everything in hand when they begin the cross-examination, including witness statements? Oh, yeah. There, there's nothing that slows down the momentum of your cross-examination or if you're having to poke around for the witness statement or the exhibit that you're going to use. There are many, many times I've seen the, wit the witness on cross-examination say something, and then you know that's different than the witness statement. So then you go <laughs> to your teammates, and then they're poking around on the table and shuffling papers, and then the paper falls, and then the notebook slams. 
And in the meantime, I'm sitting up there wondering what the heck is going on. And then finally you find it, and then you turn to the wrong page, and then you have to go to the right page, and then the witness says, no, that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. You have to have your act together. If you're going to impeach with an exhibit or with a witness statement, you have to know exactly what you're doing and do it efficiently, because then, even though your teammates will have been the ones screwing it all up, then when you run out, they run out of time on cross-examination, they're going to blame you, right? One last question. Thank you very much.